I broke my leg like, like, like the six weeks before. No, just four weeks maybe before the lockdown. So we, neither one of us could even go for like four weeks. But even four. Four. It was before though. So then it added four weeks to our um,
we're going in a second. And so, Father, help us to number our days. Help us to be uh, alert to, uh, uh, to what you're doing even today. May we make our lives count by your grace and mercy. Father, we do pray for Randy, pray for the family, bless them, encourage them, may we be a great comfort uh, to them. Pray for Daryl, pray for the extended family, and also pray for them as they uh, will, uh, will be around to help Randy get his feedback um, in order uh, without saying a year. Uh, bless and encourage us. But Father, our focus today, this morning, is worshiping you. And we pray that our worship would honor you, it would glorify you, and then it would change us. It does no good to come to church, to hear sermon after sermon, and yet not apply to our lives. So we pray that that would take place. Father, bless those that could not be here today. Uh, encourage them and strengthen them. And those of us that are here uh, do a great, deep work in our life. Father, thank you for those that are able to attend by live stream. Bless and encourage us. Christ Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. If you would, grab the song sheets that you have there. We're going to sing song number 774. It's when the roll is called up yonder. I'm, I'm thankful for this song. When you think about it, maybe you look back to the time when you were in middle school or high school or college when they would call the roll. And they would say, is uh, Tim there? You say, President, or you raise your hand, or you say whatever. Um, or Sam there.
May you also be reminded as you begin to cast your eyes on Psalm 90. It was written by Moses, and Moses wrote a lot of the Old Testament, uh, the beginning books, but also he penned this psalm here as a timely psalm, as a psalm that transcends time. It's relevant to you today, whether you're the youngest person in here or whether you're the oldest person in here. It is very important, and we can glean truth from it today that hopefully will change our lives. So let's take a look at this as we read through it, and we begin to unpack it carefully. May the Holy Spirit uh, work in our hearts. So Psalm number 90, uh, starting in the first verse, it's only 17 verses, and we will read all 17 verses. Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or even, or ever, Thou hast formed the earth and the world. Uh, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but a yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as a sheep, they are as a sleep weather. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thy anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee. Our secret sin is in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet in their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thy anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us the number of our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord. How long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to thy days, wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy word appear unto thy servant, and thy glory unto thy children. And let the beauty of the Lord, our God, be upon us, and establish thou the work of thy hands upon us. Yea, the work of thy hands establish thou it. Father, bless now. Do what we can do. Make the scriptures through the Holy Spirit be illuminated and alive, that we may be closer to you, that we may know more about you, and that our lives would be more uh, not only accountable to you, but that they would bring forth fruit that would last. Thank you now for praying in Christ's name. Amen. Charles Spurgeon has said that uh, there are some texts that are so beautiful that if the pastor said nothing all sermon long, but just read the text, it would be a sermon already. I believe that we see that in this passage here. It is so high and so lifted up and so full of God's love and mercy. As we get done back, it what seems to be a little bit confusing about evil and sin and this then that is actually, as we begin to look at it, is God's way of giving us some principles that will help us, not only now, but as we get towards the end of our life. God's word in this text reflects the beauty of God's holiness and Hesed love. And when we see Hesed love, don't get confused by that word. It's a Hebrew word. It's a word meaning, and it's used in the book of Hosea. It's what it's saying there. It's God's covenant love. God loves us unconditionally. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. What a beautiful a love to have. As much as we want to love unconditionally, it's very hard. Because we know each other. And we're far. And it's not easy to love people where they are. But God is able to do that. And I'm so glad that he is. So this deals with a difficult subject. But with such a loving promise is found within each one of these words for all the believers. So if you're here today and you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, 
this this text today, if you'll be able to listen to it and receive it, will be of great comfort. If you're here today and you do not know Christ, it ought to alarm you of your need for a Savior. There are certain subjects, my dad used to say this all the time, that are just off limits. Just uh, if you want to inflame passions, uh, bring these up and you'll do that quite quickly. Maybe you're familiar with those subjects. They say politics, religion, and death are off limits. Everybody has an opinion on them. And they can inflame passions that cause great harm among even the closest of family and friends. In our song today, God will be lovingly deal with the subject of death. Because this subject will affect every person conceived. Our human penman is Moses. Moses is the author of many books of the Old Testament, and he also penned this one here in Psalm number 90. It is more out of great experience as we begin to look at it that will help us understand the time frame that it took place in is very crucial for going to understand what is taking place. Most of the prayers that we've been looking at over the last few weeks have been for salvation and spiritual growth as we've been learning principles and the prayers of others. This prayer in its context um, of Israel's history takes place during the most difficult time and deals with a difficult subject that, that the coming expectation of death for all people. So if you are here today, this is very relevant uh, to you. We will find though it's a future subject uh, for most of us, in other words, uh, today might not be the day we go home, so it's in the future. We don't know how far in the future because we know the Bible tells us in James our life is like a vapor. It's here today, days gone tomorrow. We know we are not promised uh, even uh, tomorrow as we deal with that subject. So we want to find, um, so we'll find it in the future subject for most cases, but it needs to be praised now. So in other words, the principles we learn is for us to get ready now for the presentation of death one day. This prayer is well thought out. It's filled with biblical principles to help us stay focused as we face what will take place in the future for every person, and that is physical death. God in his mercy has given us a provision for every believer to have gladness and joy in the most difficult experience of this life. This is such an encouraging principle on a most difficult subject that is written to the believers for us. And the title of the message is Moses' Prayer for Future Gladness. Moses' Prayer for Future Gladness. Our points are simply three, and it's God's mercy affects our sanctification. God's mercy affects our sanctification. God's glory affects our successors. God's glory affects our successors. And God's beauty affects our sweat. God's beauty affects our sweat. The reason I put that one in there so that you stay for all three points to know what the sweat is. So let us uh, first look at our first consideration together. God's mercy affects our sanctification. Let's look at our text in Psalm 90, verses 14 and 15. Oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. The word glad in our text means to brighten up, uh, to, uh, to blind, which means carefree, merry, easygoing, joy, joyful, or to rejoice. You see, as we go through this journey through this life in a fallen world, the weight of our experiences of our life begins to weigh on us. Those of us that have lived any time here on earth realize that some of our problems are caused by us. But we also realize that a lot of the problems are caused just by the unfairness of this world and the evil that we see or see upon us. You'll notice that in salvation, most people come to know Christ at a young age because they have not experienced being wrong. They have not experienced the unfairness of a fallen world. And that's why some people, as they get older, are a little more condescending towards the truth of the gospel and the simplicity of it because of all the wrongs. How can there be a God if there's so much suffering? How can there be a God if I've been wronged so much in my lifetime and gone through so many difficult emotions? 
emotional things in my life, there cannot be a God. The world is very unforgiving. The wrongs that we experience are weighty upon our emotions. And our own sinful habits has caused many problems and consequences that we're dealing with. And have the weight of family. Sometimes that's where it's the hardest. It's within the own family because we're all so close. We all grew up together. We all know our uprisings and our down settings. And it's easy for that to become a very difficult place for us to be in. And have the great difficulties. The difficulties also come upon us as we get older because we begin to have emotional and physical problems. Our body doesn't quite work the way that it used to, and it can be very, very difficult. See, but this does not need to be the case. Moses' prayer is a prayer for gladness in spite of those difficulties. So the answer here is in the principle is how can we have gladness when so much weight and so much discouragement can be upon us? So God gives us principles to follow in Psalm 90 by using the experience of Israel and what they lived through in the wilderness of sin. You see this takes place as Israel leaves Egypt. As they leave Egypt with great thunder and great victory, God opens up the Red Sea and they cross the Red Sea and as they enter in to, uh, uh, into the desert, God begins to prove them. And as they get to Kadesh Barnea and they're ready to cross over into the Promised Land, they see giants. And because they see giants, they say, we can't go. And so God says, because of your lack of faith, you will wander, for everybody over the age of 20, will wander in the desert until your carcasses lie dead. And when the last person is consumed, except for Caleb and Joshua, because of their faithfulness, then I will take this new generation by faith into the promised land. Think how discouraged they were. To know that for 40 years, they're going to do nothing but do a big circle. Have you ever been on an airplane? Have you ever been on one that just had a circle because they could not land because of the weather? It gets kind of old, and you just want to get down. You can imagine what this must have been for Israel. And in the process of them living this life, Moses pens. How do you can have your gladness in spite of your circumstances? Moses works through the problems in verses 14 through 17. He gives the balm of Gilead. And maybe you've heard that comment or read it before in the scriptures. There was an old spiritual that the slaves used to sing as they were depressed for the uh, situation that they found themselves in. They called it, there is a balm in Gilead. It's an old spiritual song that compares to the healing ointment or balm to the saving power of Jesus. Uh, the one true treatment that never fails to heal our spiritual wounds. And that's what we find here, too. We find the balm. We find the ointment. We find the grace that's needed to overcome and have gladness in spite of our circumstances. So let's get a little deeper into this. And I believe that your hearts will be quite encouraged, even though you are setting the stage for the presentation of your death one day. Oh, satisfy us, delight us, because every person craves satisfaction in this life. We want to have satisfaction. We want to have gladness. We all try to get satisfaction. Sometimes we do it through our work, maybe through our wealth, or maybe through our health, uh, maybe other ways, but all those are, are important, but they are secondary. There is only one thing that can satisfy so that we can have gladness in the circumstances and the hurt and the evil that comes upon us every day. God's mercy. Amen. We all need the mercy of God to face the future. The word mercy is a covenantal word. In part, it's part of God's covenant promise. God's covenant love is displayed to us through the new birth, and we experience His mercy. His mercy encompasses all that he is. It, it is his oath, his commitment, his loving kindness, his care, his promise, his grace, and his goodness for all of his children. God will not forsake the work of his hands. 
for he is a God of mercy. The word is the very is his very character. It displays the very essence of the Godhead. Only God can give us gladness we need for every twist and turn of life so that we can be profitable for the kingdom even until we draw our last breath. It is mercy that we need to remove all of our troubles. It rises above all of life's disappointments, and we have them. Maybe you've been wrong. Maybe your emotions have gone out of whack at times. Maybe, maybe your own sin has caused many of the problems. But mercy is able to rise above all of life's disappointments, giving great gladness, even through, even though there's a pending death one day. I mean, why should we even live if we're all going to die one day? Why should we continue? Why should we get through life if the end result is that? Because God has a greater plan. And God has a plan that we'll see here. And Moses prays this because they were losing heart by wandering in the desert. They were saying it's not worth it. But it is. It allows us to rejoice in life. It allows us to continue with gladness through all the wrongs of this fallen world. Mercy brings us above all of our concerns. It rises us above all the afflictions and the sin-cursed world and the troubles of the last days that we see unfolding before our very eyes. Mercy gives acceptance in the beloved. If you're here born again today, it was God's mercy. Just His grace and His mercy to reach down and send His Son the sinless Son of Christ, the son, sinless Son of God, to die in our place. Mercy allows us to rest our tired soul on the bosom of the Master, as we found John the Beloved many times. Mercy gives us abiding hope. Mercy gives us love for souls of the saved and the unsaved. This is what we need. We need mercy. God's mercy. One time, I asked a person who was very close to me, who was much older than I was, but, but, but was a, like a mentor to me, and still is today, he's still living, and, and I enjoyed gleaning all that I had from him, and while I was sitting down, he came to Bible time many times and spoke, uh, Dr. Stevens, maybe you remember him or not, in a few years he did not come, but, but, but he came, and I sat him down, and I asked him this question, I asked him if he were to sum up his life in one, in one statement, what would it be? And he said, I can sum it up in one word, mercy. Mercy that God saved me, and mercy that God kept me. Let me explain that here. What he was saying here, what the psalmist is saying, what Moses is saying here, is that you must understand God's mercy and know God's mercy so that your affliction and your difficulty pales in the sight of God's mercy. So in other words, before mercy, everything was drama. Everything was overwhelming. Life was toil and difficult. And when we got saved, it was the same. But when we experienced God's mercy, God's mercy is so wonderful and so high and so beautiful and so given that when we see his mercy, then those problems pale in that sight and we're able to have gladness even though those things are still there. Even though we've still been wrong, even though evil is still upon us, we so seek God's mercy that this becomes very little. The reason I ate my green beans when I was a child was because I knew there was ice cream at the end. <laughs> if there was no ice cream, I'm not eating the green beans. But I could see a greater good in eating those green beans than I was going to get ice cream. Now that's ridiculous. But it shows the obvious. And that is if you understand God's mercy and you experience it and you live in it, this is pale. And Moses said, even though you're wandering because of your own sin, you can be glad all the way until you draw your last breath. May I tell you that's no different than today? I know each and every person in here is facing great difficulties because this world is not kind. It's not fair. It's not equal. It's sin-cursed. 
But God says, I still want you to accomplish my will, and I want you to have gladness even when you are on your feet and you lay there knowing in just minutes you are going to be breathing celestial air and that you are going to be standing before the one who loves you and died for you, you can have gladness. So we can have gladness, Moses said, even in the most difficult of times. Growing old, it's not easy, is it? I remember my dad sitting me down several times when I was in my 30s making this comment. It made no sense to me at all. But now that I'm 15 years old, I see the value of what he said. He said, the golden years are not when you retire. The golden years are when you're 40 and you can still do everything. He said, I might have the money, but I'm too tired. <laughs> my body won't allow me to accomplish what I want to accomplish. You see the picture here? Is your mercy here of understanding that this will pay off? The problem is, is that we get an equal. And a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And that's why even as believers, we're just unhappy. And we quit. And we give up. We say it's not worth it. Because it's just this. Because of my mercy. Whether it was your fault or not, I will forgive you and restore you and give you time. And you can have gladness. Glory. Now don't run around the auditorium. I know you want to. Because this is the truth that we live in, we can have gladness. See, this mercy is found in the heart of an eternal God. And it takes place in our life as we grow and allow the Holy Spirit to change us. This is called progressive sanctification. Gladness is a result of God's mercy through sanctification. As I allow God to grow me, I see His mercy. Because I say, oh my goodness, look at my life. It's a mess. And as God begins to shake those off and God begins to, to clear those problems up in my life, I see his mercy. His mercy doesn't consume us. I'll tell you what, if I was a creator, I don't know about it, it's benevolent as God. I would say, oh my goodness, wipe them out, let's start all over. Look at them. They're stiff necked, they're murmurers, all they do is complain, they're never happy. I give them the promised land, I told them I'll give them the victory, and they say, no. I'll get a new group, but not God, because he's a covenant-keeping God. He's a covenant-keeping God. His mercy is an eternal God. And the Holy Spirit wants to change us, and if God doesn't change us through the sanctification process, how are we going to see his mercy? Moses prayed that it would begin early. Look at our text. It says, oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy. Early with thy mercy. The word early in the Hebrew language means the break of day, the newness of the new day. Have you ever had a bad day? I'm the only one. Someone just came in line. No, but we, we've had bad days. And, and there's something about going to bed and waking up in the morning and saying, okay, it's a new day. Now, by noon, it might be as bad as the day was yesterday. But at least you get a little bit of that newness in there. Uh, and so this is what it's talking about here. It's like a sunrise, the beauty of it. it. This takes place each day, so we need the mercy of God each morning. I need to start with the one who can calm me down. I need to start with God. God, give me mercy today. I, I just need mercy. I, I have a lot of baggage. I have a lot of problems. I have a lot of situations. Give me mercy. Lord, the evil of this world is going to be upon me. In just moments, give me mercy. Hey, listen, does anything shock you today? That's how evil it is. Do you really hear any headlines at all? And you say, oh my goodness, I'm so shocked. You know, you hear 16 people killed in the city of Chicago and say, oh, it was a good weekend. That's how bad evil is today. And it's upon us, and it just doesn't let up, and it weighs on us. The world's out of control. But it's in control in God's eyes. And his mercy is able to calm us down and get us through each day. I need his compassion. I need his loving kindness. I need his peace. That's why when we don't spend time with him early, we face the day unprotected. Satisfy us every morning just as every day starts afresh. I need your mercy. That's Moses' advice and prayer. 
is that you would learn that and I would learn that and the people that were wandering, even though they're saying, what's the use? I'm going to die in the desert. I'm not going to go to the promised land. I quit. And God says, no, I still have stuff for you. I still have gladness. I still have goodness. I still want to work in your life. And that can happen today as we get older. We just quit. We put other priorities of fun and whatever to fulfill us instead of what God wants to give us. Open thy mouth, and I will fill it, says the Lord. These two verses I'm about to give you right here are in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. Poems have been written. Cards at the store have been sent with this on it, and, 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 and it's very popular. And as soon as we started, you're going to be familiar with it. You might already be familiar with it. It says in Lamentations, written by the Weeping prophet Jeremiah, as he laments over his people, he says, It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because his compassion fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. What a promise. God's mercies are new every day. A freshness of it. Where is mercy in your life? If it's here, then all this is here. It, it's light in comparison. But if mercy is not being practiced, if mercy is not being asked for, if mercy is not understood, then what happens is our problems are here and mercy is way down here and we don't see it. And all we do is murder and complain. But God says, get it right. And you can have gladness even in a sin-cursed world. Sometimes this same word early is used as a suitable time for salvation. Now is the time for salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Don't be like King Agrippa. I'll hear about this matter later. People die in an instant. People die in a moment of time. Most people die with no preparation to say goodbye to their loved ones. They go off to work. They go to the store. They, they go wherever and, 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 and their life is ended. Now is the time is what uh, this word also means. If you look it up, and I did, there's over 270, I believe. I might be off on that. Let me check where early is used. And many times it's used in salvation. This is urgent. If you're not saved, don't leave this building until you trust Christ as your Savior. As I said at the home yesterday with Daryl and his extended family and most families, we looked over at the body laying on there. She had much time to say goodbye to people. I'm sure she wanted more. But I couldn't help but to say that she doesn't want to come back. Her gladness is fulfilled in seeing the one who saved her. It's us that needs to be consoled in her death. Be saved for you do not know when you're drawing your last breath. See, this was written at the end of the wilderness wandering. The people were overwhelmed and afflicted. The word afflicted means browbeating. Is that not a good word? We can use that, browbeating. We know what that means, all of us do, to be browbeated. We can be browbeated emotionally. We can be browbeated as Christ was by a set of thorns, being browbeated on to his skin to cut him to bleed and to suffer. Uh, we can be browbeaten by a game. We can be browbeaten physically. It also means to depress, not depression, but to depress, to, 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 to not be able to lift off, not be able to get something off your chest, or not be able to get something off. That's what afflicted means. And it is like that today as we face much evil in this life, even as brief as it is. According to this song, God is fulfilling paradise promise that when we all that we all will die because of sin, that's the ultimate death. And he has determined the age that is best for us, but he gives his mercy during those years. God knows when you're going to take your last breath. He knows to what age you're going to live. Whether the soul dies in the womb, or whether the soul dies at five or ten or fifteen. Or 90 or 95 or 100, God knows. And He has given us a provision.
provision, a way for us to have gladness in every stage of our life, even in our old age, even in our young life. The Bible says this in Psalm chapter 90, verses 8, 9, and 10, some interesting verses. They are sometimes mentioned at a funeral, but in the context of what we're looking at, we need to look at it a little bit different, the way Moses intended it to be looked at, as we see the context. Psalm 90, verse 8, God has set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. In other words, God's angry with the sin of this world. We spend our years as a tale that is told. So your life, when you look at that dash between the day that you were born and the day that you died, that's the important part. That's the part that's rehash. It's your dash that matters, not the dates. And your, your life is a tale that is told. The days of our years are three, four years and ten, and that's seventy. And if by reason of strength they be forced for, yet in their strength labor and sorrow are soon cut off and fly away. In other words, the end result is still the same. A lot of, a lot of toil and a lot of labor. And God says it's got to be cut away one day because of sin. There can be no satisfaction. But I can give you gladness while you go through this life because you are my child. And I'm a covenant keeping God. And I love you, so here's the provision. The provision is mercy. Way up here. So I want you to walk around all week. And I want you to write mercy on your hand. Or write it on your face mask. And when people come by, say, this is where I'm living. I'm living in mercy. So the pandemic's way down here. I'm living in mercy. So those that wrong me, it's way down here. I'm living in mercy. So the evil that I keep seeing put upon me in this nation is way down here because I'm living in mercy. And so I can be glad and fulfill the will of God. It can't be an emotional pep every morning. It has to be founded in grace. And in grace we find God's mercy. Point number two is short. Point number three is even shorter. Point number two, because it's it. If you did this, let's go home. But he goes on, Moses. God's glory affects our successors. Now our text says, in verse number 16 of Psalm 90, Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory unto their children. But if you look up the word children in the Hebrew, he's really talking about anyone that we have influence on. So that's why we change that to affect our successor, those that are behind us, those that we have influence on. See, if you quit, how will the next generation see that there is a God? If you don't put God as the priority in your life, to serve Him first and foremost, then how are others going to go on? And that's what Moses was finding here. Those that were wandering were giving up. And what about those ones that were going to go to the promised land? And it does matter how you live. And it does matter. 
that God's will is accomplished. And God wants to use you and give you gladness because living your own life is futile and vanity. See, when we see the importance of God's will, His glory will be manifest and allow our children, those that we have influence over, to see and learn the importance of carrying out God's will at an early age. See, the reason we have these two here, Harmony and Tim, and the reason we have Sam here this summer, or just the summer, it's not here to, to make them slaves to Faith Way Baptist Church and do everything we don't want to do, but we want to pour our lives into them because we know that there's another generation maybe coming, and they need to be ready, and so we need to invest in them. If the Lord tarries, I will not accomplish everything that the Lord wants in this generation. And so we'll hand it off, and Sam will take the mantle, just like Elijah. Elisha followed Elijah, and when the mantle fell, he picked it up, and he did twice as much as Elijah did. The baton never hit the ground. So much now, men are dying, women are dying. And they're dying, and, and the next generation is not picking up the baton. It's laying in the bushes. And we want the generation behind us to, to not let that baton fall, but to grab it and say, I will carry it forward. I will press on until the Lord returns. But how are they going to see that if you're never here? How are they going to see that if you're not growing? How are they going to see the gladness of the Lord if you quit and say it's not worth it? How are they going to see the Lord if your life is filled with 100% pleasure? How are they going to see that? Even though that that generation will not see the promised land in their lifetime, the will of God goes on to the next generation. So two things here. God's purpose would be established. And that man's obedience would be established. That we would see God's will and that we'd be obedient to it. One has said this. Moses asked for display of divine power and providence clearly wrought. That all the people might cheer thereby. They could find no solace in their own disobedience, but in the obedience of God that would they find comfort. And the glory of their children. While their children were growing up and around them, they desired to see some outshining of the promises, glory leaning upon them. Their children were to inherit the land which had been given to them by the covenant and a covenant promise, and therefore they sought on their behalf some tokens of the coming good. In other words, if we just quit and we have no gladness, and we live in defeat and affliction and the evil of this world, walking around all the time, woe is me, woe is me, look how evil it's getting. Yes, it is, it's supposed to. That's what God says. But we live in mercy, and we, we are fulfilling God's will. The generation behind us sees that, and they see worth in the God that saved you. In the God that saved you. But we take the afflictions of this life and the wrongs that have happened and turn them over to God. God takes them and reorders them through His mercy. And, and, and the circumstances disappear and the sovereignty of God shows. And it increases your faith and the faith of your family. And this brings gladness into your hearts when life is so difficult. Young people are not leaving church because of the Lord, of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know why young people are leaving church? They're leaving church because of our hypocrisy. They see our lives. They say, really? Where's God? I thought God would change you. And they see this in the church, and they see this in the home. And they do not see a merry heart, a heart of gladness to serve the Lord. And you can't fake it. You can't fake it. Your children can see right through. How eagerly should we be to plead for those that we have influence over in very personal affection? Affliction, in very personal affliction, we must learn to allow God to minister and take the provision that God has given us and the promise to overcome difficulty so that on your last breath, you'll be able to say, Lord, 
finish my course. I finish it with joy. I pour my life out. I am ready. I am ready. As Paul says in Timothy 4, I am ready. That whole context of Paul saying that statement is signified in the Greek by understanding that it is not showing death, even though he says, I die. He says it's really showing a transition from this shoreline to another shoreline. Yes, he was dying physically, but he was just going home. Sandy, with all her faults and all her difficulties and all her victories, is home. And we can have that gladness even through all those things as well. See, it's about our children seeing the will of God being performed out of a willing heart. They will be content in Christ if they see the glory which results from it. See, when we sow our life out of gladness, it produces fruit that will last for generations to come. Your life will have an impact well after you're gone. Well after you're gone. This is why the Apostle John can say to 3rd John, I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth. At a funeral one time, a lady was sitting next to us. I told this once before in a different context. And sometimes at a funeral, we have a tendency, my dad, uh, after my dad retired, wanted to stay busy. So he was a greeter at a funeral home and drove the limo a little bit. And he said sometimes some of the most desperate people that die in a gunfight or a gang fight or selling drugs and they die or had drug overdose. It was amazing when whoever got up there to speak on them would make them seem almost like an angel, an angel of light, by saying what a good person they were. One time I was at a funeral and this woman was being talked about and when I got done, I did not know her very well. I said, oh my goodness, what a woman this must have been. The lady next to me must have heard me say that in my life. And she came over and she said, I sure don't remember her that way. In other words, what she was saying was, this woman did not live in gladness. She led her problems and her afflictions to lie her life, and she caused more problems in the lives of others than living a life that was full of mercy. Our last point, which is just a couple moments long, is God's beauty affects our sweat. God's beauty affects our sweat. Let's look at our text, Psalm 90, verse 17. And let the beauty of the Lord, our God, be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. In other words, when I think of work, I think of sweat. Because if you're going to work, you're going to sweat. Now, you might not physically sweat. If you're outside, you're going to physically sweat. But those of you that work jobs, it's a sweat. It's hard work. You've got to get up and go at it. And that's what we're talking about here. The verse, what a wonderful verse. The beauty of the Lord. We need to spend more time on meditating on God's beauty. When's the last time you just meditated on the beauty of the Lord? And we're not talking about his physical beauty because he has no body. We're talking about God is beautiful because of who he is and how he corresponds with us. That's where his beauty is. To see him in his glory is to see him in his beauty. His attributes, his love, his kind, kindness towards us. There's nothing as beautiful as the Lord. The word beauty in Hebrew can be translated pleasant. Think about that. Pleasant. It is the favor of God. It is the purity of God. It is the brightness of His holiness. It's His attractiveness. It's His attribute. Sometimes a person doesn't have to be beautiful to be beautiful. Right? When we see somebody and we meet them and we say, oh, what a caring soul. What a, what, a, what, a, what, a, what a kind person. We see within them the beauty of God. 
and we see it reflected in their life. It is what every child of God will say once he knows God. What a beautiful God we serve. Psalm 73, 25 says, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides thee. In other words, the, the, the whole earth is, 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 is a waste. If there's no God, heaven is not heaven. If Christ is not there, heaven is not worth any better. I know this might sound odd, but I think it will draw the picture in your mind. It would be better to be in hell with Christ than to be in heaven without him. How could we be without him? He's everything. He's our beauty. He's our Savior. He's everything. Praise God. And we'll be in heaven with him. Martin Luther, in trying to explain this beauty, said, Beauty is like a deluge of grace. Like drinking from a fire hydrant instead of a spigot. Just overwhelm you. It's like being on the beach and the waves crashing and spilling you over, over, and over again. That is what his mercy and grace is like. A flood of grace. Not a tsunami that destroys, but the gracious grace that picks us up to see and behold this beauty again. No matter what you've done, God's willing to pick you back up. Amen. He's willing to restore you. He's willing to give you life again. He can restore time. He can restore the day of the locusts. He can make your life profitable and full of gladness. Don't quit. It's too early to quit. I was a quitter when I was young. If it got too hard, I quit. So finally, I took a bunch of post-it notes one day, so frustrated with my quitting after I became a Christian. I took those little post-it notes. I put them all over my office so it was covered and said, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. It's always too early to quit. The light you see in the tunnel is not a train. It's God drawing you to his light and his beauty. Get right and go on. God's got great plans for you. God can turn what seems to be so awful and do something so beautiful. The beauty and the love of God is unparalleled. There's nothing that can match it. God's beauty is found in Christ, who was hung on the tree for us, so that you and I can live. Psalm 45, 2, 3, I'm uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Psalm 45, 2 says, Thou art fairer. Than the children of men, and grace is poured into thy lips, therefore God has blessed thee forever. But he goes on in that verse, he talks about work. As we see his beauty, we ought to take our hands and put him to work. Because of his beauty, it should compel us to accomplish his will by the work of our hands. The text tells us the work of our hands is established by the way God has ordained work before the fall. Before the fall, before sin, God put Adam in the garden and told him to send it. Work was established before the fall. The difference with the work today is it's harder because the world is cursed. The ground is thorns and thistles. Everything is more difficult because it's sin cursed. The repetition of this prayer here is unmistakable and we must take note to it. It indicates an intense desire that God would would enable them to carry out his plans and do the work. God has work for us. God has work where you work. God has work in our community. God has work with our neighbors. God has work for us to get the gospel out. At the same time, it is a prayer for gladness so we would not be focused on the difficulty of this life, but God's mercy would rise above it of any hurt or immaturity. This is a proper prayer. It needs to be offered at all times that God would enable us to carry out his purpose and God would permit it to be established. Listen, he was telling them, Moses will say, long after you're dead and you're buried in the sand of this wandering wilderness, your fruit can still remain because this fruit was going into the promised land. And how are they going to do that if you quit? To establish churches and produce a willingness to share the gospel. I'm saying today, I'm a living testimony of grace before you, and that is because of the labors of others to carry out God's work in front of you. Because they were faithful, somebody took this to me and taught me Christianity at your age, I became a born-again believer. 
So we want our work flow to come out of his work so fruit that is produced would endure. If all the work we do here at Faithway does not flow out of the work of God, then it's all vain. It's ridiculous. Our plans mean nothing if they're not his plans. The Bible tells us in Psalm 127, 1, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it, except the Lord keep the city to watch and wake it, but in vain. Moses was told by the Lord that he would not enter the promised land because of his own sin. Moses did not let that stop him. He should have quit. He should have quit. He should have just gone home. She said, this is not worth it. If I can't go to the promised land, this is a rebellious people. They're too hard. If I don't get the fruit of the promised land, I'm not going. But that's what we did. Moses didn't let that stop him. We, we see the gladness because of God's mercy. We see him work of his hands investing in others. He continued to have gladness, letting God's work flow throw through him to raise up the next generation of men that would go to the promised land. Men! Like Joshua. Men like Caleb. Men like Jabez. That made a difference when they came into the new land because somebody invested in them. Let us pray that God's work would not be hindered by our formality of religion, by our carnality and our coldness that enters into our spiritual life sometimes as we get disfronted with the unfairness of life, keep mercy where it should be. Every day, God, give me new mercy. But let us pray as Moses did. Let thy work appear. Let thy work appear in its clarity, its power, and its authority, sealing God giving graces and the inward working. And we may rest, embracing the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and finding gladness in him and not in our own God. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1, Remember now the Creator of the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years dry not, draw nigh, that thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. In other words, if you live a life right now and just sow your oats, you're going to struggle when you get older. Those of you that are saved later in life, just remember God's mercy to overcome the things you're going through. But for the vast majority of us, may God's mercy be raised high so the afflictions and the evil are not even noticeable. God can do that. So that when you lay on your bed, all alone, or with your family surrounding you, whatever it might be, suddenly or over time, and you grasp that last breath, you will be able to say, I am in the gladness of the Lord of his mercy. And because of that, I've been able to influence the generation behind me. Who are you influencing right now for the future? Who? That's what we should do. If you're here today and you're not born again, today's the day. Today's the day to walk the aisle. If you're not sure if you're saved, if you're not sure what to do, you need to get right, whatever it is, please come so that we can show you and let you know. As we have